uh, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, the February webinar. I am uh, Jamshid Arjuman, Chief Science Officer for the FSHD Society. Join here uh, with my colleague, Lee Reynolds, and we're filling in for June Kinoshita, who usually does an amazing job running these webinars. So uh, it takes two of us to, to really fill in her shoes. Um, I'm really delighted for um, today's presentation to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Eva Chin from uh, Solve FSHD. Um, before we get started, though, uh, I'd like to maybe mention some uh, familiar housekeeping uh, terms. So um, uh, during the presentation, if you have any questions at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a Q&A bubble right next to the chat. If you can uh, type in any questions you have in there, uh, Lee and I will try to, during the uh, Q&A portion of the, after the presentation, try to address as many of them as possible. Um, please make sure that the Q&A are in there. That's probably what we'll be monitoring primarily. If it goes in the chat, we might miss it. And we'll do our best to cover as many of the questions coming in uh, during the presentation. Um, uh, as I would like to introduce Eva, I, I was reading through uh, uh, your bio, Eva, and it's, it's so exciting. You've, you've lived so many different places and you've done so many different things. I didn't think I would do it justice if I just read out loud all of your accomplishments. So if you don't mind, maybe we'll do something a little bit different and, and I'll ask you to share some of your experiences um, uh, highlighting some of the, the what was exciting to you during your career development. But uh, one thing that really struck me as exciting is that most people that enter science, um, they'll, they'll switch fields a little bit uh, during their career. So they may do their PhD or MD PhD in a particular field. And then um, as their career develops, they transition and they start doing different things. Do I understand correctly? You actually started out doing um, your graduate work in muscle physiology from the get-go and you've kind of been active in this field the, the entire time. Is that correct? That's right, Jamshid. You know, I, I don't want to date myself, but I did completed my PhD in, in muscle physiology and biochemistry in the early 90s in Canada at the University of Waterloo. And I really just was always fascinated by learning more about muscle, muscle function, how does muscle fatigue, how, you know, a lot of the interest initially was in athletic performance. You know, many of us thought we could be better athletes if we could understand muscle function. Um, and I, you know, went from the physiology level down to cell biology, molecular biology, and then I'd say in the late 90s really shifted the focus to understanding disease mechanisms and what happens in muscle in various diseases, whether it's aging, metabolic disease, or more recently neuromuscular disease. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. This is you bringing a breadth of experience and, and uh, you know, that throughout your career, but uh, you've also lived in a lot of different places and you've worked in vastly different settings. I myself have worked in uh, um, a little bit in academia, mostly through my, when I was doing my degree in the part of my postdoc, but then I switched over to industry, biotech and nonprofit sector, but you've also run uh, the full gamut in there and you've also had the opportunity to live in a lot of places. So I, I see that you've done part of your postdoctoral training in Australia, in Texas. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your experiences in academia, uh, private sector, as well as some of the exciting places that you've lived in? Yeah, absolutely. And before I, I jump into that, maybe I'll just share anecdotally that, you know, I've uh, started off on this journey with my husband and we now have two sons and whether they love it or hate it, they've all been um, committed to this adventure in life. Uh, and now we have lived in four different countries, including the U.S. And, and within the U.S. across various states. So it's almost like living in eight different countries. Um, but yeah, we originally left Canada when I was offered a postdoctoral fellowship down in Sydney, Australia. And we thought, wow, what a great way to, you know, learn a new scientific technology, meet people in a different culture, live in a different country, and they speak English. So, you know, that, that was a fun journey down to Australia. Um, and then during that time, though, this is when molecular biology was really on the rise and being able to make these genetically modified mice, transgenic mice, knockout mice was, was so powerful. And I really wanted to learn the genetic technologies. So I was fortunate to get into uh, another postdoctoral fellowship at a big academic medical center in Texas at UT Southwest Medical Center in Dallas. And that's really where I started thinking more about diseases and how do we modulate genes and disease processes. 
you know, I had some amazing mentors along the way. Um, and as I tell people, I went to the U.S. as a postdoc thinking I'd be there two or three years and was there 23 years later. Um, by that time, having worked uh, for two companies in the U.S., Pfizer, uh, some of you may have heard of Pfizer, and, <laughs> and Cytokinetics. Uh, and in between, I went back to academia and I worked in academia as a as an assistant and then associate professor for eight years at the University of Maryland, you know, wow. and always studying muscle from different approaches in industry and academia. That's a really strong perspective to have to be able to bring those different perspectives um, to your current position. And so I, um, I don't know if, uh, um, I think this is a pretty good segue. Maybe we can transition into what brought you back uh, uh, from your last job. I think that it was in, uh, were you in Norway? At, at you were in Denmark. Yeah, we Denmark. ventured to Europe yeah. and Denmark. So yeah, and I'm happy to share that. So we, you know, I was with a really wonderful company in the Bay Area called Cytokinetics and I was working on, you know, ways to activate muscle to improve muscle function, muscle force. And I'll touch upon that a little in some slides that I have. And then we were using these muscle activators for treatments, potential treatments for ALS and SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. Um, I also led a cardiac program and, and I really loved working for a small company working on muscle modulators. Um, but the challenge was really being able to afford housing in the Bay Area and, um, and I would often get called by recruiters. So I happened to get called by a headhunter looking for somebody to lead their non-clinical development. And, and they gave me a C-level title and lured me over to Denmark. And my family was up for the challenge. So we were actually in Aarhus, Denmark, which is a small company about three hours from Copenhagen. And I led a company there to take their first molecule from a research idea with some preclinical animal model data into the clinic that and that molecule is now in phase two. So we loved living in Denmark. It was a wonderful place to be, but as many people can appreciate with COVID, there were some challenges uh, when you can't travel back and forth as easily and you can't get back to see family. Um, and my sons decided they, they, they actually wanted to go back to the US. They really missed places like Chipotle and In-N-Out Burger and <laughs> other things. So. Um, but so we were looking for, you know, either I was going to work remotely for a Danish company, which, you know, was, was coming along uh, or work for another company. And, and then I got, you know, I got approached by a headhunter for a very unique opportunity to work in the FSHD field. I will say at the time, I was also talking to some of the other biotech companies about roles in their companies where they were working on FSHD. So I felt like I had at least three possible opportunities all around FSHD. And while FSHD is not my scientific background, it overlaps a lot, as you mentioned, in the muscle background. Uh, nonetheless, I was open to opportunities and I was very fortunate then to be attracted. Uh, and I'll tell you a bit more of the story with some slides, uh, but to work with uh, Chip Wilson and, and his group here under Hold It All to start this new entity called Solve FSHD. Uh, also with uh, Neil Camarda, who's probably uh, well known in the FSHD community with FSHD yes. Canada, and really take their ideas for investing and putting money into FSHD research and just really, you know, build it up on a bigger scale. And, you know, I originally being from Canada and having sons, you know, ready to go off to high school, we felt coming back to Canada was good. And so, yeah, we're here in Vancouver now with the Solve FSHD. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for uh, opening up and, and sharing your experiences. We're delighted to have you and very happy to, to have uh, you and not only on the program, but also uh, as part of the, the FSHD team working on, on this indication. Uh, so uh, I'd love to transition this and, and give you the, uh, uh, the forum to kind of present the slides and I'm going to mute myself and go off screen. Feel free to, to start okay. your presentation. And um, uh, at the end, when you're done, we'll, uh, Lee and I can come back and we can field questions from the audience. Wonderful. Okay, Great. thanks very much for the introduction, Thank Jamshi. You. That was fun as well. And hello to everybody that's online listening. Um, great to be part of this community and to be speaking to you. Um, I'm going to try to share my slides. Uh, I'm in an office with a lot of technology and I have many screens around me and I'll try to uh, share the right one. So can you see a presentation and presentation mode? We are just seeing your slides, so it looks good to go. Yeah, it looks great. 
And if I advance, let's see. The question is, can I advance them? Can you see now one with yep. the mountains? Yes. Okay, great. And I can see your pictures on my other screen. Okay, so I probably won't be looking at the camera as much as I look at the slides on my other screen. So, um, so yeah, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you Solve FSHD, uh, what, our, what our goal, what our mission is, a little bit about our organizational structure <clears throat> and what we hope to accomplish over the next six years to begin with. And, you know, if, if we're successful, it, it will continue beyond that. Um, but uh, I'll start with, uh, you know, we are placed here on the West Coast in Vancouver among the beautiful mountains. This picture is taken from uh, Chip Wilson's Hold It All website. And, and Chip Wilson, as uh, some of you may or may not know, is uh, somebody who is been, has been living with FSHD for probably about 30 years and intermittently has you know, invested in research activities and decided a few years ago to more formally uh, make it a goal of his and build an entity within the Hold It All uh, family here. So we have, we're in a family office and uh, Solve FSHD is an entity within that. I have been an N of one uh, with Solve FSHD until today. And I'll put a shout out to my new colleague, Jeremy Gralnick, who has joined me as a project manager who is listening in. So I think we're gonna do great things, but really we are led by the thinking and the support of people shown on this next slide. Hopefully you see in front of you, Chip Wilson, who uh, as many of you know, he's a serial entrepreneur successful with founding Lululemon and taking that company public, um, has many other investment interests, uh, but really now is dedicating a lot of effort and focus to understanding how can we solve FSHD. And several years back, he teamed up with Neil Camarda, who has been running the FSHD Canada Foundation for about 10 years, I believe, Neil. And, and the two of them do move at a pretty fast pace. So together with the two of them on the board of directors, and then a, as a, a newer member of the Hold It All team, our chief investment officer, Ian Bogdanaris, they form the board of directors overseeing the, um, the initiatives that we're taking within Solve FSHD. And, and really what we wanna do is partner with other organizations. Uh, I've been fortunate that through Neil and Chip and others, I've been introduced to many people that have been leading the way in FSHD research, uh, early stages clinical development. That's how I met both uh, Jamsheed and, and Mark Stone with the F and June with FSHD Society. I've been fortunate to already meet Jeff Statland and Robbie Tawil, who lead the Clinical Trial Research Network, along with uh, Michaela and Kylie. I remember all the support staff. I mean, a wonderful organization running your clinical trial research network and, and friends of FSH and FSHD Global. And I'm probably forgetting some, but I know there's a lot of other organizations out there that have really pulled together to bring the patient's need to the forefront and, and really spearheaded a lot of great research that's come out of academic labs, has gone into some companies. And now we have other companies with technologies that are putting FSHD on their pipeline. And really we wanna take and work with all of those existing uh, groups and really catalyze the, the, the pace of the innovation and really try to accelerate getting more drugs into clinical trials. Um, it is certainly the goal of CHIP to have a cure or to have a, a treatment available within six years. Those of us that have worked in drug development will find that a challenging timeline, but, but I also tell uh, people like Chip and Neil and, and the rest of you out there that have S FSHD, I think that an effective, uh, an, a goal will be achieved if we can get many of you into clinical trials. And if there are positive effects while in clinical trials, to get those companies to run what's called an open label extension where you can stay in the clinical trial and continue to benefit from the treatment while it's undergoing all the steps in the R&D process that are required before you get uh, a marketing approval to actually get the, the drug approved and marketed by all clinicians. But the win is to get more people on the registries into clinical trials and get a pipeline built so that many of you will benefit from these treatments. 
Um, and, and that's, uh, you know, that, that's a, a big challenge, but I think it's one that's doable with communities working together and with, you know, additional investment that we can help out with. Um, so if I look then, if you look on our website, I, and I put the link uh, on the previous slide, but it's solvefshd.com. Our primary purpose is to solve FSHD2 while further benefiting FSHD1. Um, and for this group, I probably don't need to define FSHD1 versus FSHD2. I think many of you have read and know the literature on the level of V4Z4 repeats, defining whether you're FSHD1 or 2. But the reason they're prioritized in this order is that I think a lot of the efforts currently have been on FSHD1. But Chip has FSHD2 and Neil has FSHD1. So we just want to make sure there's some balance and that we make sure FSHD2, which is even more rare than FSHD1, also gets you know, adequate funding. Um, and the things we want to do then is, is to invest in activities that will help to remove barriers for accelerating drug development. Um, and this is then synchronized with the, the Wilson family, Chip and Summer and, and their five boys, which form the Wilson family, the Wilson Five Foundation. They have many philanthropic and, and other investment initiatives, but really what they're doing now is, you know, they, they as, a, as a group, you know, want to create value by improving the possibilities for people to live longer, healthier, and more fun lives. I mean, that's fundamental in their philosophy. You can find that on their website. And we're doing this now at Solve FSHD with the angle of, of bringing those longer, healthier, and more fulfilling lives to people with FSHD. Our strategy overall is to improve the number of molecules going into a pipeline and the number that get to approval. And if any of you have read, you know, any of the literature, I don't know if you can see my pointer. I don't know if I can use my um, laser pen. You know, the statistics in pharmaceutical R&D are, are, are unfortunately rather bleak in that, you know, you often need tens of thousands of molecules identified in the research discovery phase, moving in through preclinical or animal testing to get ones that even get into phase one, which is really a safety testing phase. And that's really to protect the health of, uh, of, of, of people like yourselves, human subjects. And if a drug looks good in phase one, then you move into phase two, which are your clinical trials in people that have that disease. In this case, people that have been genetically uh, confirmed to have FSHD1 or FSHD2. If things look good in a small phase two trial, then you run the bigger phase three trial, which is hundreds to thousands in order to get FDA approval. You know, and typically <clears throat> you'll see in slides that this process can take 12 to 15 years and cost 1.5 to $2 billion. And certainly when I was at Pfizer and I worked on new, I worked on programs in diabetes and obesity, as well as osteoporosis, and then the new area of muscle biology and frailty, you know, that was the standard timeline. But now what we're seeing with rare diseases where, again, you have a defined population with a genetic cause, and you partner with groups like yourselves, the, the patients that are really advocating for therapies faster, sooner, and you work with the regulators and a lot of the activities and initiatives I know that FSHD Society has led with the voice of the patient, you can get this timeline probably down to six to eight years now, which is reasonable. And as I said, you know, I think a real win is to get molecules into this phase of phase two and to have what's called open label extension where if you're on the treatment, you stay in a safety arm of the trial, you continue to stay on study drug and you continue to be monitored. Um, back to then what we want to do at Solve FSHD, you know, we've identified you know, as a, as a business process, we've identified what we feel are the problems and then we have proposed what will be the solution. And this really in, in word and bullet form is, is where we are going to focus our investment. And, you know, in a press release that will come out in a few weeks, we're, we're a little bit behind in the public relations department here, but, um, you know, the Wilson family, together with the support of Neil Camarda, is, is committing $100 million over the next six years towards accelerating this, uh, getting new therapies for FSHD. And we want to do that by getting more therapies into clinical trials, stimulating the entry into clinical trial, 
by investing in early stage biotech and biopharma companies. We wanna support the ongoing natural history studies. And that is something now that we have already done through a donation that's gone through FSHD Canada to the, the CTRN to continue to support all the you know, really fantastic work that's ongoing with the natural history study and the biobanking of plasma and muscle samples. We wanna support entry into phase two clinical trials by mid-stage pharma and biotech companies. So there are companies out there that I have worked for before or that I'm aware of that I think have molecules where that scientific approach could benefit uh, people with FSHD. And we wanna talk to those companies and see if they would accelerate putting their assets into clinical trials for FSHD too. And then what's really important too is to develop the st strategic partners with the mid and large size pharma companies you know, whether that be the um, companies like Biogen, Novartis, Pfizer, Merck, I mean, ultimately to get a, a, a molecule to phase three and approval, even the small companies will partner with the large companies. So to make sure that the large companies, Roche and others, continue to have FSHD on their radar and that the investments in the early stage companies will eventually lead to partnerships where those large pharma companies can take it through to approval and registration in uh, Canada, US, Europe, et cetera. I mean, the other problem we're trying to also tackle is a high attrition rate of therapeutics. As I mentioned, you know, it's, it's a, a long time and high cost for drug development, but the pharmaceutical R&D world together with the clinical researchers, clinical pharmacologists, and also some of the academic research clinicians they have now shown some things that are critical to facilitating or, or enhancing the probability of success in clinical trials. And part of that is through finding what we all refer to as biomarkers. Many of you are aware that MRI imaging is, is a key biomarker, but ideally clinicians and pharmaceutical companies will have a, a circulating biomarker so that they can take a blood sample or maybe collect some urine, but find something in, in a bodily fluid that can be easily measured in a centralized lab that is an early predictor of success, that's an early predictor of reducing fibrosis in muscle, improving function, and that helps the pharma R&D companies make quicker decisions in their clinical trials and can accelerate the pace of their drug development. We want to establish a solve FSHD solutions preclinical CRO, and that's really just to harmonize preclinical research especially on lead molecules with small early stage companies where they may not have vivarium and vivariums and to help facilitate their ability to generate high quality data that would support either an IND or CTA submission to allow entry into clinical trials or to get orphan drug designation. So really regulatory based studies. And then as I mentioned already invest in a pre Oh, also invest in preclinical predictability of clinical outcomes. And that's largely through the work that's done with the CTRN. So if I look then, I'll show you graphically, you know, the, the vision we have and our strategic plan at Solve FSHD. It's really these four pillars. It's to fund research on biomarkers and some on new targets. Those are going to be grants, largely distributed through academic organizations. We want to invest in biotech and biopharma companies, early stage companies, either you know, new ideas coming out of academic institutions or early stage companies that have had seed round funding and now are doing a series A or series B raise. We do want to provide the support of a centralized CRO and that's something we're you know, just starting to think about how that would be organized. But I will mention that you know, the TREAT NMD group is a, a group that's been around quite a while that has recommended standardized protocols for preclinical testing for initially for the DMD community, but it's across various neuromuscular diseases. And the more that we have harmonized protocols and standardized study designs, the more in the investments we make into the preclinical animal model research, the more likely we're going to get the solid data that will help us to both have reproducibility, but also predictability for things like human dose projections. And that ultimately does enhance the probability of success when you get into the clinic. 
And then the fourth pillar, which I haven't mentioned, is to offer a substantial prize, likely through the X Prize Foundation. Chip is a big believer that, you know, big problems get solved by big team efforts. And so we do want to put out a call later in the year for teams to put in applications for an X Prize targeted at solving FSHD. And it'll be a really broad call with the idea being that we need to reach scientists in, in the broader community. We absolutely fundamentally will be working with and partnering with and continue to build the efforts of the current scientists working on FSHD, but we also want to broaden the horizon because I think it's it's been shown that to solve any problem, whether it's in science or engineering or outside the scientific field, you need people looking at the problem from multiple angles, multiple directions. And we just feel we need a bigger sphere looking at FSHD, trying to help us with new ideas on the higher risk approaches to solving FSHD. So that is the strategic pillars. We really have mapped out a six year timeline. Chip is a very goal-driven person. So our goal, and I think it's consistent with what FSHD Society is wanting to do with their therapeutics accelerator. You know, we'd like to have a successful treatment in six years. This is my, you know, a high level Gantt showing timelines for investing in grants and other activities like the CRO, as well as biotech companies. So we'll do this early influx. We'll run the X Prize, support the validation of biomarker, hopefully support several molecules getting in through phase one and two A clinical studies, and then hopefully get one molecule into a phase two or three clinical study, largely through developing the partnerships with the larger pharma companies, larger pharma biotech companies. So we have some timelines we've mapped out for ourselves. Uh, and now we'll wor be working in the next uh, uh, months to years to map out the specifics. From a scientific biology point of view, you know, most of you have probably seen something similar to this. And I'll just wanted to acknowledge that while we will focus on disease modifying approaches, which include modulating duct spore levels, we will do it from, I'll say, a modality agnostic approach. The current duct spore inhibitor that was in clinical trials by Fulcrum is the P38 inhibitor. That's a small molecule. We'll continue to invest across modalities and companies working on small molecules working on targeting RNA, either microRNA or doing um, siRNA or antisense oligos, as well as gene editing, CRISPR-Cas9. And one thing I don't have there, we're also open to cell-based therapies and genetically modified cell therapies. Anything that goes after the disease process, both duct spore, and then again, because we want to focus on FSHD2, likely the gene SMCHD1, possibly other FSHD2 genes. Uh, another part of another key part of the, the disease process in FSHD2 is the inflammation and the immune response. And any, any potential treatments that target this angle, we're also very interested in. That's on our radar. This is probably an area where there is still more basic research, too, that needs to be done. Um, and then I'm also interested, we're so, also interested in other muscle targeted approaches. And that's largely the angle I bring in, having now worked, you know, the last six years with other pharma companies that are directly targeting muscle, where you get an acute pharmacodynamic response, where you increase muscle force and you increase muscle function. And these have been shown by the group at Cytokinetics with their work on teroceptive and raldoceptive, that if you can boost muscle function, you can also improve clinically meaningful outcome measures. In their case, there were measurements like the six minute walk time, the six minute walk distance, and various parameters of uh, in inspiration and expiration. So some of the respiratory function parameters. So we feel there could be benefit from some muscle targeted approaches. One wouldn't look at those as disease modifying. Those are more in the symptom management category, but we feel that this is a good area to invest in as well. And at the end of the day, those muscle targeted therapies would lead to, in the case of FSHD, an increase in muscle versus fat content, will lead to an increase in muscle force and muscle function. Hopefully, hopefully the ability for people with FSHD to get out of a chair, 
to be able to walk across the room with less effort, even reduce fatigability because you could be, we could be improving muscle endurance and possibly also shifting muscle fiber type. So the idea again is that we have a disease uh, process, a genetically known disease process, and that's great for getting a lot of biotech companies interested because they want a genetically defined disease. And we'll support some of the gene modulating approaches, but we're also open to therapeutics that affect both the ability of muscle to counter the atrophy and the inflammatory detrimental responses that we see in FSHD, which includes both inability of the muscle to regrow, um, some of the deficits that we believe to be uh, in the mitochondrial function, and overall try to just improve muscle contractility and muscle function. Currently, and this may not be an exhaustive list, but I think many of us keep our own list of the emerging pipeline in FSHD. There are companies working on small molecule approaches, uh, largely targeting modulation of DUX4. There are companies working on RNAi therapeutics. And as we understand it, Dyne and Navidity are saying by second half of 2022 that they will begin I, well, they begin clinical studies, meaning they're currently in the preclinical phase doing their IND enabling talk studies. And then we've got an, another group of companies, and I'm sure the list is longer, and I only have uh, several of them shown here, that are in the discovery phase, maybe early preclinical, that potentially could get into the clinic in, in two or three years. Um, but just to, I think, recognize that I think there is an emerging pipeline. I know FSHD Society has a number of companies on their pipeline, and we really want to increase the number of companies on the pipeline, and we want to progress them from left to right so we have more in that phase two and phase three clinical development space. So then the other thing I wanted to talk about briefly is, is just, again, based on my own experience, Having worked in a big pharma company like Pfizer, having worked in a mid-sized company like Cytokinetics, and having worked in really a startup company that was first out of an academic lab, NMD Pharma, uh, where I was able to lead teams to take their early stage research molecules and move them into the clinic, or in some cases, move them from um, early phase clinical trials to NDA submission or being NDA submission ready. Um, and that was the case with Tiracemptive at Cytokinetics. Um, unfortunately, even that one didn't have strong enough phase three data to file the IND, but I really worked across that entire space from early research molecule of an idea, all through the safety testing, getting it into the clinic, and then the ongoing testing where I personally oversaw all of the non-clinical safety testing that's required with the ongoing clinical trial. So I partner closely with the clinical, the clinicians who design the clinical trial studies. How, how many subjects do they want? How many people in a phase two? How many in a phase three? And then I would build the non-clinical plan around that. What toxicology studies are required? How much drug supply do we need to run toxicology studies? And, and how do we provide all of the support for clinical to get through clinical trials? So really, I've worked a lot in this, what we'll call translational gap between early phase discovery, the ideas that come out of academic labs, some pharma companies have their own internal discovery programs, and then translate it to where we can not only run clinical trials, but run clinical trials with, with better chances of success. And I will say that through that all, and this is the theme in all pharma biotech companies, and I think it's where we often have to work with, you know, ideas coming out of acad academia and really helping them build the teams. We are, we are solving complex problems, and to do that, you need a team. You usually need your clinician, which are generally your neuromuscular disease specialists, and not, not to pick on them, but so people like um, Jeff Statlin and Robbie Tuell, but there are many more out there, John Day and others we've worked with. I hate mentioning names because I know I forget people, but there's a lot of wonderful neuromuscular disease clinicians that I've worked with in industry and in academia. They are pivotal to the clinical trial design. They are often backed and supported by clinical pharmacologists the scientists who know drug metabolism, pharmacokinetics, biostatisticians, 
We have our preclinical leads who do the pharmacology to look at efficacy in the animal models, rodent and non-rodent. We need our toxicologists and our non-clinical safety people. We need to work with our chemists and our chemical manufacturing colleagues who know how to take a molecule. When you first test it, you might only need 10 or 100 milligrams, but then you need to make kilogram quantity scales in your clinical trial. So how do you scale a molecule from 100 milligrams to two kilograms to 25 or 125 kilograms. And that involves the, the chemical engineers that do process chemistry. So you need all of these people around the table working on plans, very intricate. Those of you that have done any project management and developed Gantz, you know, we used to have 4,000 line Gantz in, in, the, in, the, in the programs that we ran at Pfizer. I think I can get it down to about 300 lines now with a small company, but you need multiple people doing activities that are highly integrated and dependent on one another. Communication is key, working together on a team is key. That's how we achieve goals. And then I just wanted to mention in terms of my own experience and what I'd like to, and hopefully can bring to the FSHD community. I'm admittedly not an FSHD guru, um, I have to learn the genetics and, and I appreciate um, the interactions with the academics who continue to teach me the, the genetics of FSHD. But ultimately, I, I do believe it is, it is a, muscle, um, a muscle problem that we can develop a therapeutic for. So with cytokinetics, I worked on uh, REL deceptive, which was in phase two and three for ALS and SMA. And I mentioned tiraceptive was in phase three for ALS while I was there. I led the program in the cardiac field for cytokinetics for a molecule called CK274, now known as Mavicamptin. That's now in phase 2B for obstructive uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and I think I learned a lot from working with cardiologists and how they use tools to help predict the success of dose prediction from preclinical to clinical, to, to clin clinical patients. And then at NMD Pharma, I was the first person on the development team and I took their lead molecule, NMD670, from a molecule that they were scaling up in CMC all through non-clinical safety testing, led the team that then filed the CTA, worked with you know, a really brilliant clinician, uh, John Hutchison in the UK, and they are now finishing the phase 2A trial in Myasenia Gravis and they have now gotten funding to go into SMA. That, that funding was just announced, uh, I think, the other day. So, so I, I have some experience putting molecules in the clinic and I really wanna partner with you know, the many organizations and the many uh, individuals who have experience in, in various parts of this you know, ecosystem to try to get more molecules into clinical trials and get a better Hama Canadian, better shot on goal, and getting a molecule that works in, in people with FSHD. And that really brings meaningful improvements in your, in your daily function. So just a little bit more then on, I guess, my bias and my view to where we really need some effort. And it's a general finding that, you know, we can often get molecules. So this is again, the drug discovery pipeline, the early discovery idea, validating the target. In this case, Dux4 would be a validated target. P38 was a validated target because it modulates the activity of Dux4. There may be other targets based on the inflammatory response, the cytokines, maybe IL-6. We know we have these other FSHD2 genes, SMCHD1 and others. You know, we may have other targets out there. And then you go through a process of drug screening, you find a lead, you go through process chemistry, as I mentioned, you scale it up. And then you go through preclinical development, which are, is the safety testing needed before you can file your IND or CTA to run any clinical trials. And this is the space largely that I have worked with as mentioned. Um, and, and then just again, just as a, another pictogram, the uh, things I've mentioned before, you know, research again requires a lot of molecules going through a series of screening assays. We think of it as a funnel. And then how do we reduce to the best compounds that we think have the chances of success? They have to be efficacious, they have to be safe. And I'd say the one take home message that I would share is, Safety, safety, safety. You know, a lot of molecules are shown to be efficacious, but the reason most molecules fail 
is that they're not safe and you cannot dose high enough in you know, either healthy volunteers or in, in this case, in, in FSHD subjects, if you were to enroll in a clinical trial, often we can't dose high enough to see efficacy because there's some safety hurdle along the way. Um, but one thing I wanna show you, this is again, you know, how we do the, these funnels to get to that one molecule and then reduce the number of compounds. Well, I also look at this as an hour of class. So we'll move, you know, from thousands of molecules, we might move three through preclinical development to get one that comes through and is approved. But it's really like an hourglass. Here, there's a lot of investment. You narrow to one compound. But when you put that one compound through, all of a sudden, your cost goes up like an hourglass. So for one compound, to get it through preclinical development, I ran 20 studies that went into the document for the CTA filing to get into clinical trials. So your costs really balloon and you go here, you know, as I was taught by one of my mentors at Cytokinetics, uh, Patty Malik, who's, who's, you know, brilliant uh, pharmaceutical R&D executive. And he said, you know, when you're doing research, you're talking about six digit figures and you get into non-clinical development. Now we're talking seven digit figures. So we're easily into the millions. Then we get into clinical development and we're into eight or nine digit figures. So, you know, the cost goes up immensely if you have a molecule that's moving through. And that's just something to keep in mind. And, and certainly where we wanna help out with Solve FSHD due to the ability of, of people like, you know, Chip Wilson and the Wilson family, um, and again, guided by a board of directors is to be able to take anything that comes through and just help in the bump up in investment that's needed to get these molecules through to approval. I will cite this one case study if anybody is interested on the pharma R&D side. Um, this is a report that came out from the FDA. Actually, Robert Califf was the former FDA commissioner. I believe he's now again the FDA commissioner. Um, and I had the good fortune of meeting him when he came to cytokinetics because he was on our advisory board for the molecule that was going into phase two. And again, just to reiterate what I said earlier, you know, in this, in this, case study summary here, what they indicated is, you know, many of the failures occur, some due to lack of efficacy, some due to lack of safety, but most often it's due to lack of safety relative to lack of efficacy. And so I think the focus has to be in where, you know, certainly the companies that we invest in, and, and again, I think our investments will include not just dollars, but really our insight and you know our guidance for moving through this R&D process that we need to understand safety margins. We need to understand predictability of animal models. So rodent models, non-rodent models, and being able to predict human dose is really important to know, can you get to the, it's actually not dose, it's, it's, their, it's their exposure, their plasma concentration. So there's some you know, nuances to how you run your studies to enhance the probability of success. I think I'll skip that. This just shows the number of safety studies that are required to go all the way. Again, a general safety package to get you all the way to drug approval will definitely be an eight digit figure. Um, and you need, do need to be prepared to stop because things often follow due to safety issues. Um, I'll just show one more schematic. And I think this is where you know, the FSHD community is really well positioned. There are some great animal models now that have been developed uh, through a number of academic labs, a number of uh, animal models, rodent and non-rodent with, as we, under, as we know that there's a development of a pig model. Uh, in the past, I have worked with dog models of muscle function. <clears throat> and of course, non-human primates is another type of non-rodent model. Uh, again, before you can go into, generally, well, before you can go into clinical trials, you need or you would want to have efficacy in a rodent and a non-rodent model because that type of data helps you then to predict and project your efficacious dose and the efficacious plasma concentration or exposure to the drug that you need. And that's an important piece you need to build what's called pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, PKPD models to enhance the ability to monitor your drug concentration, your drug dose with your clinical outcomes and the biomarkers that we talked about. So um, 
I'll just say again that we're exploring and supporting disease modifying as well as symptom management therapies. And I think I'm going to skip through some of the other detailed muscle biology. If anybody's interested, please feel free to reach out. I love talking about muscle biology, but based on the companies I've worked on before, I think there could be effective therapies by modulating the activity of the nerve interacting with the muscle to basically boost the muscle force production by increasing excitability. This was the approach with the CLC1 channel inhibitors at NAD Pharma. And then at cytokinetics, boosting the amount of force produced by the muscle contractile proteins to engage and pr produce more force for every given stimulus. So I think these are all viable approaches that are relevant to FSHD. And I'll skip all of the scientific details. And I'll close by saying that really, again, where we want to partner and facilitate is the transition from discovery to clinical, recognizing this is not a straight path. This is a winding road. And anytime molecules move into clinical development, they may not be immediate successes, but work with the pharma companies, work with the biotech companies to build the data that you can then try to analyze that data and maybe go back to preclinical models and do some additional testing. So you may have to go backwards at times before you can go forward. Certainly not a straight path, but we feel we can help to guide both investments in academic research as well as pharmaceutical biotech R&D to get to a, a clinically uh, effective treatment for FSHD. And again, te teamwork is really the key. Uh, and if there is some success, if there are some success stories, they are the ones that have come out of the SMA community where you had strong leadership with Cure SMA, which initially was families of SMA. So families, family members with SMA, along with the SMA Foundation. And the SMA Foundation was the group that had the bigger investment dollars to facilitate getting more biotech companies to work on SMA. And they now have three approved therapies, one which is an antisense oligo, one which is a gene therapy, a very expensive gene therapy, but nonetheless a gene therapy, and then one that's a small molecule therapy. So this was uh, developed by Ionis and then co-developed by Biogen. This is the gene therapy that came out of Avexis and then was partnered and marketed now by Novartis. And Evrisd was a molecule that came out of a small company, PTC, that then partnered with Roche to complete all the clinical trial. So they're great success stories of what can happen when you have academic ideas linked to biotech companies, linked to big pharma with a sizable step in investment. And so SMA Foundation is a group we talk to often in terms of how they operated and trying to have an operating model similar to them. You know, and again, success stories, which we hope we can follow up on. Um, and that's our strategy. Perhaps a bit long-winded, but happy to take questions. Oh, thank you very much. That was a uh, really fantastic uh, and, and very comprehensive tour de force presentation on not only the priorities of uh, solve FSHD, but also um, um, the landscape and the ecosystem for drug development. Uh, um, I'm, uh, uh, I welcome now everybody to uh, from the audience if you'd like to submit some questions. And as people are typing in questions, maybe I can get things started. Uh, one of the things in the drug development pipeline that that uh, the more I've been in this business, the more I find fascinating is that the pipeline is always kind of looks like it's segmented. You do the discovery work and then you move on to do the preclinical work and so on. And they're actually quite overlapping uh, in many places and they involve so many different teams. Um, and quite often, even at the early stages where there's a safety data that's being uh, produced, the uh, clinical teams need to make sure that they have outcome measures, uh, that they start looking at sites. And, and it's, it's a really big collaborative effort and it needs a lot of expertise. And certainly having worked in some of the smaller uh, companies and startups myself in my career, they don't usually have those expertise on hand. So, and they seldom have the resources to also uh, hire that expertise or even consultants to do that effectively. So uh, I was really pleased to see that one of the things that Solve FSHD is gonna do is pr provide that CRO uh, kind of platform for, uh, to provide that 
level of expertise and maybe uh, what smaller companies need to move their uh, candidate forward. And uh, uh, this is absolutely a fantastic uh, uh, program that you're putting together. Um, and um, um, so I'm sorry, I guess that wasn't very much of a question. It was a statement. <laughs> Happy to have statements, thank you. <laughs> Uh, very good. So let's take some of these questions. I don't know if you can see the, the questions, but maybe Ali, do you have anything uh, that pops to uh, pops up here? Yeah, I do. just a quick, simple one. We have a lot of folks asking of the availability of the presentation and the slides. So that I figure is an easy yes or no. Yep. Um, I'll PDF it to you and then that'll yeah, be fine. Perfect. Yep. So we'll make the recording available and we can also add a link to the PDF. Thank you. That's an easy one. We did have a question that came in earlier. Um, does FSHD and aging muscle loss relate in any way? Well, I think with any disease, there's an underlying change with aging. And I think what you have then is, you know, added to it, if you have a known genetic cause, you have the disease process. I mean, I am newer to FSHD mm -hmm. and I've read a few papers that say that if, if the penetrance of the DZ D4Z4 repeats or any of the genes are related to telomere length, then it could also be an additional age dependent interaction because the telomeres, you know, in general shorten with each cell division and therefore will shorten with age. So there could be a genetic component that is a combination of age and genetics. I wouldn't be the expert, but I have read a few papers on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, but I think to the point that you know, I previously, when I started at Pfizer, we were working on approaches for frailty. What, what, is the, what is the cause of age-dependent loss of muscle mass and function? And I think a lot of that is due to the loss of the neural innervation of the muscle, but then there's also age-dependent changes in ability to make proteins, for example. And I think all of those combine then with the complexity of the FSHD mutations on top of it and probably accelerates an aging process. Okay, great. So we have a question about it. Yep. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jim Chi. Oh, no, I was just looking at the question one uh, that actually touched on the two strategies uh, that you mentioned, a therapeutic uh, is a uh, DUX inhibitor in combination with muscle boosters or mother growth. Uh, would, do you see those as being a combinatorial drug therapy yeah. or something in the future? Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that. And I have given talks before on combination therapies. And, and again, if you think about approaches in many other diseases, you know, it's, it's going to be a combination of treatments. And I've always talked about this cocktail approach. And if you look either in the AIDS literature or in oncology, it is this combination. And there's actually regulatory guidance on that. And, and I have worked on combo therapies. In fact, when I was at Cytokinetics, we were testing uh, Reldesemptive in combination with Nusinersen and the Evrisdi molecule because that was being approved. So we have had to do combination treatments and, um, and you might even have to do combination safety testing if you're gonna be uh, adding treatments together. Absolutely though, from the point of view of treatment, yeah, I believe it, it's uh, necessary and we'll definitely support that, yeah. Right. And there's a, actually a related question that came in is like, how close are we to getting muscle targeted therapies, um, uh, assuming that it would be a very broad market for big pharma and, uh, but, and also extremely beneficial to those living with the condition? Yeah. It has been a common topic of discussion, both when I was at Cytokinetics and when I was at NMD Pharma. And, and you know, early on, it, the clinicians want to have a very focused clinical development program to get a clear answer. Does this molecule work in this indication? But we'd often talk about these uh, basket trial designs where you might actually have people. In Myo29, when it was first tested in FSHD, I mean, it was a basket trial with a lot of yep. different neuromuscular diseases. But it's an absolute value add for the companies that have the small molecule. And, and it's definitely something I'm talking to the former companies I was with, as well as other companies where I have read about a molecule that they're testing in maybe Becker muscular dystrophy, where I think the science makes sense that it would work in FSHD. And that's where we would approach them to say, look, can we facilitate some work, either initial preclinical testing or clinical? I absolutely think there's probably about four molecules I'm aware of that I would love to, you know, again, we've engaged in discussion with some of those companies. It's just probably gonna take a little bit more time to work out those investments. Well, that's fantastic. And um, what happened to Lee? She disappeared. Um, mm -hmm. 
Sorry, I'm. Uh, That's okay. You, I can pop back in. You were handling. Yeah, yeah please pop back in. I'm. Uh, I was listening. I felt to like a lurker. Eva. No, no, no. <laughs> Go ahead. Do you have the next question? We should take turns so I can listen. Yeah, to absolutely, Eva's. absolutely. Um, from Rick, we have modifying nerves to affect muscles. Is that after a cure has been introduced, as in regeneration, or could that possibly affect the progression of the disease? Yeah, and that's an excellent question. You know, I have, um, when I worked solely on muscle, I used to say the muscle starts at the membrane on down and we forget about the nerve because it's too complicated. But I've had many conversations with people about the neuroscience and then the neuromuscular disease clinicians. And number one, I think it's, it's, it's accepted that if we improve the health of the muscle and the muscle functions better, part of what it does is it releases growth factors and that can have retrograde signaling to help the nerve coming into the muscle. And that's an important side effect of the improvement in muscle function, but you also could consider, and I think one thing that's unknown, I've really, I've, I've taken a, a preliminary look at the literature and I don't think it's well characterized. And it's a question I have, uh, I have asked people like John Day, you know, do we know anything about, you know, the, the neuron side of neuromuscular disease? Are, are there any evidence of a transmission failure from nerve to muscle? And I don't think that we know that. And, and if we know that there's a deficit, then we absolutely could also consider therapies that improve the function of the nerve. But I think right now we don't, we don't know enough, um, but it's an absolutely great point and something that I think we need to keep on the radar for FSHD. Absolutely. I think in line with that, mm -hmm. I think uh, another disease like uh, Kennedy's disease, spinal yes. uh, uh, muscular, muscular, muscular dis yeah, yeah. atrophy, I think uh, was believed to be uh, a, a nerve disease, a, a neuromuscular, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's motor muscle. neuron disease. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, if you express that mutation uh, uh, in the muscle, you also have the symptoms of the disease. So it could be. Yeah. Uh, ALS is that. like that as well. Yeah. 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 No, but interesting. Um, just a, another question. This is about the animal models. That, uh, one of the challenges, I think, in FSHD and generating an animal model is that DUX4 is really a primate gene. And so mm -hmm. any of the other animal models, basically, it's an artificial um, uh, yeah. expression. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, especially in light of FSHD, which uh, is the regulation of the endogenous gene? Uh, not necessarily just ducks for activity downstream. Um, That's such an important point. And again, you know, I think at the high level, we have animal models and everything looks good for making predictions. But as everybody knows, in, in whatever field they're in, you know, and it comes to whether I'm, or not me, but my husband is cooking in the kitchen or I'm in the lab, right? The devil is in the details. And so I think there are some of these subtle details. When you force overexpression of a gene that's not normally there, you are going to induce some response that may not be in the native um, disease scenario. And I think that is one of the challenges and it's just something to be prepared for. I mean, I think we have to go with the tools we have with the mouse models, with the pig model where you have used an overexpression system and you won't know until you extrapolate your dose projections and some of your you know, mechanism of action readouts and your biomarkers, you won't know until you get to that clinical trial, whether the preclinical is predictive. And I think a piece a lot of companies and, and a lot of organizations don't think about or don't want to go back and do, but I've always said that you're going to collect data in your clinical study that then may inform you of how to go back and basically fix or have a better preclinical model to be predictive. And I'd say the one field I worked in where I thought they really had it figured out was osteoporosis. I mean, it was just really well characterized that bone mineral density in animal models predicted risk of fracture in humans. And they really had a good animal model system. They didn't know how half the drugs worked, but they had a good prediction system. Whereas I think in muscle, my view has been, we understand a lot of the molecular details and we can build systems to test molecules, but we don't yet know what they're, what they're gonna predict in terms of clinical outcomes. And so we have to come back and, and re-enter that loop again at some point. It's a great yeah. point, absolutely important point. Yeah. Great, and uh, maybe as uh, since we're coming up to the top of the hour, uh, one last question is, uh, I think somebody did the math based on your projections of, and said 2027 20, <laughs> seems to be a goal for a cure, but you suspect treatments may become available before then and uh, mentioning 2025, which is actually a date that we've come, uh, uh, yeah. we've publicized as when we'd like yeah. to see success. Well, I'll say we, we went from 
planning to have this as cure FSHD to being solve FSHD. So obviously we like to think about a solve. I think we'll have a solve, we'll have a solution. It certainly could be much earlier. Again, it depends how you define that. If you wanna go all the way to, in the US, okay. NDA approval and insurance company coverage, that uh, will probably take longer. But if you can have clinical trials being run by sponsors that will offer open label extension or what cytokinetics used to do because they were heavily involved, this was with the ALS community, they, they had what they called managed access. So anyone that was in the clinical trial that benefited from it, even though they stopped development, they kept them in a study monitored safety and they let them stay on study drug. So I think those are the types of scenarios we have to think about as being the solve as being the treatment, because if you can benefit from a treatment, then we need companies to fund you seeing on them. And that I think is doable, yes. And, and I think that's a really great way of defining success um, uh, and, and keeping the options open. Yeah. I think one yeah. of the very important thing to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, how are we doing on time, Lee? I see, I see other questions and yeah. if I, you oh, know, I'm always happy sorry. to send, send replies by email later if, that, if that's an option. So um, Great. Let, we are actually at the top of the hour. So why don't we do this? If people have additional questions, something that wasn't covered, throw those into the Q&A or the chat section now and we can get those to you. Even we can include any answers in with our recap when we share the slides in the recording. And I may very quickly say, I see there's several questions about uh, clinical trials. Again, you know, we, we from our website are directing people to other websites like the FSHD Society and, and FSHD Canada. And I think that, you know, following on clinicaltrials.gov, that's your, it's a good place to start. And you can see which sites are running a clinical trial and then contact CTR. the sites directly or, or reach out to FSHD Society, to the FSHD Canada. Um, I should have put my email address, CTRN, absolutely. Um, because I would, I would drop a link there. in the chat to our website Great. where they can sign up to be a part of our, <laughs> our research registry. And that's one of the ways that we try to keep patients informed on what's happening as well. So if anyone wants to yeah. grab that out of the chat and sign up, we yes. do our best to try and keep you informed. Yes. And thanks for the question from Portugal as well. I appreciate that this is a really international group and I value that having been around the world and back a few times. So I think the same holds true across the EU as well as the North America for clinical trials. Yeah. Great. Well, with that, I think uh, I would like to thank you again, Eva, for joining us and uh, and for joining the the all this, you know, a new stake, major stakeholder in the fight against FSHD. And I look really forward to collaborating with you and your organization um, in years to come. This is very exciting for the field to have you join us. Well, thank um, you very much. And I value the partnership we already have with uh, FSHD uh, Society and the other organizations out there. Thanks, great. everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.